Endurance Junkie Podcast, episode 56. Hey Junkie, welcome to another episode of the Endurance Junkie Podcast, the show where I will be interviewing some of the fastest, smartest and most inspiring people active in the endurance world today. Despite only starting to compete in triathlon in 2012, Adriel Young has been to Kona twice, was top age grouper at the 70.3 Asia Pacific Championships and also finished the 2015 Norseman Extreme Triathlon. Last year, he turned to the relatively new sport of swim run, winning the mixed team race of Ötelö in Sweden, the sport's biggest race that also doubles as a world championship, back to back in 2016 and 2017. Adriel, thanks for uh, taking the time to come here on the show today. Now, for those of us who don't know you, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your sporting background growing up in Australia? Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, I I grew up in a small town south of Sydney, about two hours south of Sydney, called uh, Mossvale in Australia. Uh, it's a it was a really small town. It's actually gr- growing to almost be part of Sydney nowadays, but. Um, I grew up doing playing a heap of different sports. My parents were really uh, good with that. I did everything. My my family was into horse riding, and I did everything: water polo, surfing, you name it. I I did it as a kid and played hockey, and so I was really lucky in that sort of scape of things. And then after uh, after school, I moved to Bondi, where I got a job as a Bondi lifeguard. And I my sporting background. I would say I played a lot of sport, but I was never very good at sport. I really loved sport growing up. I played rugby, but I was no, I was no good at sport, but I really loved it. And then after school, I got into a bit of surf lifesaving um, down at Bondi. I, I raced for Bondi Surf Club, and I, I got into a lot of uh, surf ski paddling, which is it's a short sort of four-minute race for those people that don't know it, and you just in and out of the surf sort of on a kayak looking thing you sit on top of so I did a lot of paddling and um yeah I worked as a lifeguard and that was sort of my sporting career up until I got into a bit of triathlon yeah so your typical Australian uh upbringing I guess just outdoors and and very very active um you weren't good you, you said but is that because you played so many sports and never really um target at one specific sport to, to try to get to a higher level no i think it was more that i just wasn't very skilled i don't know i i wasn't fast i wasn't big so rugby i i, I love playing rugby so i was stuck out on the wing because i was small but i wasn't fast so I was, I was never in a good team or, but i just i just loved playing sports so uh, it didn't really matter what sort of level i was playing as long as i was playing a lot of sports now that uh, life-saving thing that's pretty big in australia you got some national competitions going on there did, did you do well in that or uh, was it also just for fun i mean it the the thing about life-saving it's a, such a big sport over here but there's absolutely no money so you wouldn't say there's well there are some people that do it professionally but they don't make any money so uh, i always did it for fun and we, it was sort of more of a way to travel a bit with the guys from the surf club, go around to different races. But it, I, I loved the sport, but I wasn't. I wouldn't say I was that good. I made one Australian final in my whole time doing it, and that was in the double ski. So, mm. okay, we've, we've got this show, show here on television, uh, Bondi Rescue. Were, were you featured in that one? Yeah. So after school, I got a job down at Bondi, and I I worked there for seven from 2008 to two before I moved to Europe in 2014. And the whole time I was there, they were filming that show. So yeah, yeah, you, you might see me on there if you watch it. Okay, I'll have a look at it uh, next time it's on. <laughs> um, you mentioned your triathlon career before. Um, when looking at your results and everything, it, it seemed like a really short but pretty solid uh, career. You, you won a couple of age group races in, in 70.3 distance. You raced Kona twice. Uh, you finished Norseman in Sweden or in Norway. Um, can you tell us a bit about that and, and how you got involved in, in triathlon and how you progressed so, so quickly? Yeah, I mean, w- with in Australia, I guess a lot of people know about triathlon as something because a kid you knew about but you didn't really know what triathlon was. And then I, because, and then I, 
I was at work one day and a bunch of us from work were like, oh, let's do one of these Iron Man things that everyone started talking about. And we're like, we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. So we, so we signed up for Melbourne Iron Man, which was in 2013. So then we're like, oh, we better go and do like a half of one of these before to see if we can actually do it. So we signed up for the Australian half Iron Man in Port Macquarie there. And I think it was October 2012, which is my first triathlon. And uh, it went it went good. Like I got a time, I got a penalty for drafting. I had no idea what I was doing. And I got a penalty for drafting out of like an aid station, and then and then I ran. Uh, I re- my run was heaps better than I thought it would ever be because I'd I'd never been very good at running before that. And so then I signed up for one more seventy point three before Melbourne, which was uh, Auckland. And it was the it was the first year they had Auckland seventy point three, and it became a uh, it was like a Asia Pacific Championships. So they gave out spots to Kona there, and I was the first age grouper across the line. So I got myself a spot to Kona, which was a bit of a shock and surprise for me. So uh, it just went really quickly there. So then obviously I did Melbourne, and then which which was a bit sad because that was our going to be our only Ironman, and then they cut the swim short. So then, yeah. so which was nice, sort of for me that my first full Ironman was Kona. <laughs> so and then and then the same thing happened the year exactly the same the year after I went and did Auckland again, got that spot to Kona, so I went back to Kona as my second full Ironman. So you must have done some some pretty intensive training then, if you you know coming from no cycling hardly any running and then then you become top age grouper and, and you qualify for Kona straight away yeah I mean uh, some people try and say that I've got a lot of talent but I would say it's a lot more hard work because I I really work hard when uh, worked hard on my running and cycling I, I sort of gave everything I had to it I was even though I was working full-time every other spare minute although my wife now isn't so happy that I was doing this but I was giving everything I could so I worked really hard on my run and my riding back then and I sort of have that with most sports I do I I want to give it if I'm going to have a give it a shot I give everything I've got so I might not be the most talented out there but I try and be the one that's working the hardest yeah all right if you have to choose between uh, between Kona and and Norseman which one would you say is the toughest I think I had a lot tougher day. Oh, they're both really tough in their own respect. It's hard to say. I mean, I Norseman, and that was that's sort of ended my triathlon career because of how hard the bike riding was in that race, and how hard I trained for it, and then it still smashed me on the bike. But I would say, oh, Kona, you know, Kona's its own thing out there in the heat, and it's. One thing I loved about Norseman is it's such it was it was a nice ending to my triathlon career because I was out there and I had my wife following in the car the whole time. You don't get to do that in triathlon, and they're there the whole time, like every they're just lapping you on the car and cheering for you, and they're your aid station along the way. So that's really nice, complete opposite to say Kona when you're out in the lava fields by yourself for hours. And so I mean they're both tough. I, got I couldn't really – they're tough in their own right, both those races. So you, you knew going into Norseman that this was going to be your last race? Nah, okay. I didn't. I, was, I think it was about the last climb on the bike where I was like uh, – I was – that was pretty – I was at least going to have a good break from uh, racing after that. That was sort of the plan, 2016, to just do nothing. But it, it didn't end up like that, but it – that was the plan. Yeah, okay. Well, you live in Sweden now. Um, how did you get? How did you end up there? And, and how does that compare to living uh, and spending your days in Bondi? Yeah, I mean it's a different world over here. I, I moved over here in 2014 with my then girlfriend uh, Caro. We we'd lived. She'd lived there in Australia in Bondi with me for like five years. So it was sort of my turn to come and test. And it was only going to be a year. I got leave from work for a year, and then now it's been three so uh, we we live in like a little a very little house up in the forest here outside of Gothenburg on a lake it's uh I, I love it it's so beautiful here the nature and and to have I've got like 
forests for days in my backyard so i can run swim ride it's yeah it's a pretty special place here did you uh have a night get any winter sports i i i have been last year i sort of took up i've got a few aussie mates that live here also they're in the same sort of boat most aussies that you meet over here are in the same sort of boat as you they've met a swedish girl we've all started playing ice hockey so we play a fair bit like last winter we played a lot of ice hockey i would say maybe three four sometimes five times a week we were out on the ice for hours so uh and I've, I've tried cross country skiing as well. I did. There's a famous race over here called Vasalopet, and I, I did that. Just I hadn't really skied before. We just did that for fun, me and my uh, wife. That's got like fifteen or sixteen thousand people at the starting line, right? Yeah, it's a crazy mass start. They have a they have like days before where you can do it like a they call it open open spore, which is like open track where you can just go and do it. And they get obviously thousands there, but then the actual day. It's like a 16,000 person mass start and that's the one that we did and you're pretty much you're pretty much walking for the first two k's it's just straight up hills there's so many people but it's that uh, was a cool race um, we're, we're talking about going back again and doing that and train for it this time all right good one well let's talk uh, swim run which is uh, the main reason why i brought you on the show um Utilo, is that that how you pronounce it yeah, so it's Ertele, which is island to island in Swedish. All right, okay. I'll talk a bit about swim run. What is it actually? Because it's it's huge in Sweden, but you know it's re- still relatively unknown in the rest of the world. Yeah, so it, it was sort of a sport that I would say it was born from. There's a lot of people. It's not exactly when it started, but this race Ertele, which is the biggest race, longest and most lo- longest standing race, you can say in Sweden. Uh, in the world it's been going this year was its 12th year that started from a bet from some uh four guys four friends and they bet each other it was like a drunken bet at a bar they bet each other they were in teams of two who could go across this uh archipelago from north to south or south to north it was in that in those days and um they did it i think it took them like 36 hours for them to get across there and then this sport was the next year became a race. So yeah, it's it's in Sweden the sport of swim run is I would say to me it seems bigger than triathlon. It's crazy over here. So every weekend you can find like two or three races throughout summer on on a particular weekend. So yeah. so and you carry all your gear. I mean you, you run in your wetsuit and you've got your paddles on and you you swim with your shoes and. Yes. So, because it was born as a point-to-point race, you could start with whatever you wanted, but you had to finish with that. So, over time now, it's sort of a few more regulations on how big and small things are you can carry. But the the essence of the sport is start with what you've got, finish, get there as fast as you can. It's point-to-point. The the course is marked, and yeah, who's the fastest there? So, how did you get involved? I I did do a swim run a long time ago, but it was after after um, 2015 Norseman. I was going to have a bit of a break, and then I, I'd heard of Ertelö. Obviously, living here, it's such a big thing. So I was like, oh, that's something I would would like to do one day. And then I got talking with a local guy who I train with a fair bit here, Martin Flinter. He's a world champion in multi-sport he's he's done it all in the world of multi-sport and he lives not far from me and i got in contact with him and asked him if he wanted to race it and he he's won it twice before the in the earlier years so i was seeing if he was keen to but he uh he unfortunately said no because he goes and races in china at that time of the year and there's a lot of multi-sport races on at this time of the year now in china which pay quite good money he said uh maybe you should ask my uh partner which is Eva, the lady that I raced with the last two years in Ertula, which ended up being great because uh, we, we work really well together and she's I'm so glad we've raced together these last two years. She's an amazing athlete. Yeah, she's got a pretty good resume as well. Uh, she's, a, I think, a duathlon world champ and, and she raced uh, professionally as a triathlete. So, yeah, it's a good a good teammate to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you won the, the, the mixed uh, team there in, in 2016 and then you recently successfully 
uh, defended your title. But if I'm correct, I mean, you are, together with a Swiss girl who came third in, in the mixed category, the only non-Swedes on the, on the podium. Um, how do you see the future of the sport? Do you think it, it has a potential to, to grow and become something international or, or global? Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at the start list, you can just see how it's growing. I think there was 22 different countries racing. It just that that's out of 150 teams, so it's growing like crazy in Europe at the moment. I know there's races popping up everywhere. Even that series, this Ertler series, now they have seven or eight stops, and I think only two of them are in Sweden. The rest are out through Switzerland and Croatia. So there's races everywhere. You can there's Isles of Sicily. So I see it in Europe getting bigger. And then while I was at Ertler this year, there was some guys there from Swim Run USA, which is up in Maine, and their race is growing. So they're looking to expand. So and me and my me and my partner have a race, Swim Run Australia, which is in Sydney. It's a lot shorter than the races here in uh, Sweden. But that the it's been unbelievable how keen people are to do that. We've sold out the two years we've held that. So it's uh it's the sport is definitely growing. I think it's just a matter of time. It's so easy for people to do. They don't need to travel with a bike and they can just train wherever they want. You just sort of go out your door and you can if you've got water or water by you can just run anywhere in harbors and lakes. So it's really easy for easily accessible. So it's sort of a sport that I see that's going to grow really quickly. No, because you, you put on events in Australia yourself. Um, you've done it for a couple of years. Yeah, so this 2018, we are third year in a row there in Sydney Harbour. We run a swim run event. So then, that's not from point to point, or uh... Uh, not? No, they run because they loop back on their course which is a bit of a shame, but it's so hard for us to organise there in Sydney Harbour with all the different councils. So the course isn't long. I think it's 18 kilometres total, but and it just loops back on itself. But the 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 way that people have uh, received the race has been unbelievable. First year was a bit, a bit hard explaining what the – you can take whatever you want and pe- people like so didn't understand that they had to swim with their shoes. But once you sort of get through that barrier – and people start doing the race, they realize how much fun it is and how and the the team aspect is a huge part to making your day fun. Um, you don't have to carry your uh, your food and, and drinks with you, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yes and no. I mean, Ert, okay. Ert is, a, is a nine hour uh, for us, just under nine hours, I would say, around there. Mark and the men's do around eight hours, so it's like an Ironman. Mm-hmm. There's only nine aid stations over the whole course so none of them carry gels or anything like every, they're very um they're very environmentally conscious earth alert. so there's gels there that you can like homemade gels and homemade bars you can eat on the spot but if you want to take your own gels you have to carry them so i mean i've carried 17 gels in my inside my wetsuit this year All right so you become lighter as you go along that's that's pretty good <laughs> What are the longest swims and the, and the longest runs there in, in Otelo? Um The longest swim is the first swim in the morning. It's about 1.8 kilometers. And then there's actually a swim that's probably harder. It's 1.4 kilometers, but it cops a lot of the weather. It's called, in Sweden, in Swedish, it's called Grisimet, which is translate directly to pig swim. <laughs> but it, it's, 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 it's a hard swim because really you're fighting the chop the whole way there. The fact that the you know the, the swims are pretty short makes it accessible, I guess, for for a lot a lot of people. I think that's that's why triathlon is sometimes so difficult to get started because you need to to swim you know, almost four kilometers, which is a which is pretty long from from a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. Like I mean, if uh, there's swims there throughout the day that were fifty meters long, so it really there and there's races all around the world now with the longest swim can be maybe three or 400 meters. So it's really that chopping between swimming and running. One nice thing is to have your partner there beside you the whole time, which gives people a little bit more confidence that are new to the sport, that they the, that don't like the swimming aspect. They've got a friend there that's looking, they're looking out for each other the whole way. So yeah. I think that helps to bring a lot of new, 
new people into the sport. Okay. And what does a typical training week look like for you then? Did you often train together with uh, with Eva? Un- unfortunately, Eva was injured leading up to Ertula uh, this year, so she, she didn't run for the f- five, six weeks leading into the race. We were a bit unsure if we were even going to race, but um, she just toughed it out. But uh, a usual week, I would say, I just try and alternate swim, run, swim, run, and then maybe one specific swim, run session a week if or two if I get a chance. It's really easy for me to do swim run sessions out of my door, but it, that's sort of like a bit of a catch because I love doing those sessions, but I know to be better running, you have to do run specific sessions and same with swimming. It's not just, uh, it's, uh, although I love doing just swim run sessions, it's not, so maybe not the best training all the time to do, but then again, you pick up a lot of skills doing swim runs. So. Mm. Well, if you won, if you won the world championship twice in a row, you must be doing something, right? <laughs> um, did you only swim uh, in open water, or you have access to a pool there? I, I there I do have access to a pool, but I didn't. I did a little bit of swimming over winter there, but I I live maybe oh, it's like a three hundred meter walk to like a huge lake where I can swim across. It's like a two kilometer straight across, so I've, I've got a pretty good training base there I, I don't really like to go to the pool when i have such nice swimming right at my door okay i can understand that um do you have a bucket list of, of races or events you want to do i mean swim one swim run or, or anything else yeah i mean there's so many beautiful locations now popping up of swim runs that i love to do uh but nothing that like, grabs me that like obviously norseman and Urtula were right up there on my list of like cool races i wanted to do but there's nothing that really sticking out for me at the moment. But I think it's just a matter of time before there's a swim run race that pops up. There's a few like I raced in VAR this year in Croatia, and that was, I really like that. There's one swim run in Engadine, Switzerland. It's sort of on my bucket list, I guess you could say. But it's it's not a long race, but it's so the photos there just look so beautiful up in the Alps. So. I'd like to tick that off. And there's also talks of a swim run about to pop up in Tasmania that looks pretty special. That's uh, going to be nice, yeah. Yeah, that I'd like to be a part of that. All right. Um, yeah, swim run and anything else, triathlon, what do you see as your biggest accomplishment so far? Is it, uh, a, is it a world championship title or is it qualified yeah, for Kona? I think, or? I think it's hard to go past the world championship title there in uh, at Ertel Ert back to back and it, I think I'll only go back there and the plan is to only ever if I can convince Eva to go back she had a bit of a tough race obviously not r- running before she came across the line and went straight into the medical tent for a couple of hours but if I can convince her to come back one more time that's the goal to just go back there but in terms of uh, in terms of like things that I'm really <laughs> proud of would have to be Ertula winning the world championships in ITU long course that was pretty cool as well that was a bit like unexpected I could say and then uh what else yeah Kona I mean finished top 10 in my age group and Kona was good Uh, I'm not a big fan of Ironman distance I really like half Ironman distance because I can really push myself but uh it was yeah I mean that's pretty special to go to Kona twice what about uh, your stint in Greece there, where you worked in uh, as a rescue swimmer for a while, helping save refugees uh, who were trying to make it across from Turkey to Greece? And, uh, we've seen a lot of footage on television, and, and it must be bloody hard to be right in the middle of them. Yeah, I mean, like you say, I, I'd seen so much on TV, and I sort of... I. I'd spoken to a lot of guys that had already been down there, and but it was nothing can prepare you for to seeing like holding young kids that are I don't know like babies like my daughter was six months old that have been out on sea it all night and then you're there to save save them like you can't I can't really put into words how how it was down there but uh it was uh, it was an experience for sure and I wish I could have been there for longer and given more of my given more but it was just uh what they are going through is unbelievable. I mean, you're picking up doctors that are 
live these like beautiful lives and wealthy and smart people and they're just you see them like in there they're just all they care about is surviving the next day sort of thing and it really puts life into perspective yeah that's just exactly what i was going to say um any disappointments in your sporting career no nah, not that i uh i mean i nah i can't picture anything i one thing I'm really happy about is I never not finished a race, and that's sort of what I want to keep going. Maybe that's why I want to stop racing because I I don't want to give that up. I really like that I've never not finished a race, even if I'm having a bad day. I think it's really important to just finish off a race. So, much wood I don't get injured out there because I really do want to finish a race. Every race I do. Yeah, awesome. Um- yeah, last last big question: nutrition and and diet. That seems to be like a hot topic these days. You know, people go paleo, gluten free, high fat, low carb, you name it. What, what's your take on that? You, you follow a specific diet, or you, you try to pay attention to it? I'm no, nah, I wouldn't say I'm very good with my diet. I do try and eat a bit healthier, closer to races. I don't like cut out a lot of. I don't like to have a lot of fiber leading into a race, but. In terms of like a specific diet, I am not uh, one to follow that. I I'm really bad with eating chocolate and lollies. I I treat myself probably too much. I like, but I I like variety. I think everything in moderation works well for me. I just try and take a little bit. And I, my wife cooks a lot. I'm very lucky. She cooks a lot of the food at home, and we just we just eat sort of like an average person. I would say we eat pasta we eat meat we eat salad you yeah i'm not specific at all about what i eat i would say but i uh in terms of nutrition in a race uh i i have a friend who lives in australia who's a nutritionist and he sort of plans out every race i do for me because i'm not very good with what i should be eating and how much i'm not so good on the technical side but he has it pretty dialed in he he wrote a book called eat sweat think or go faster now I've, I've, he'll probably be upset with me i've forgotten that <laughs> but, uh, it, it, he he talks a lot about separating uh, your your nutrition with your hydration so and that seems to work really well for me so i've been following he, he owns a company called shots nutrition and they they that works really well with my stomach so separating the carbs and the hydration so and that's really important in, I guess, races like Ertolo where you have to carry everything with you and getting the fluids in is sometimes hard. I mean, got, some guys drink the water out there in Ertolo because it's, um, it's not so much salt in the water up in the Baltic there. Uh, you know, Everyone does something different. So I think it's very uh, personal-based nutritionist, nutrition and diet and everyone following on twitter some of the pro triathletes and the way they write it's uh it's very it's very interesting to see people's point of views and how different everyone is so and who gets yeah. sponsored by which company yeah exactly <laughs> all right awesome well thanks for your time Adriel. um how can people get in touch with you if they want to made um probably social media is the best i i actually just started a new uh, Instagram called swim run underscore world and I'm going to try and post more swim run based stuff and my training so I can give people more of a look into the world of swim run that how I see it and the racing I'm doing and if anyone has any questions there I'm really happy to answer everything I'm very transparent with everything I do so in terms of swim run and, and racing and so if they want to get in touch with me, I think Instagram's the best, which is swimrun underscore world. Yeah, that's good. Now I'll put it up in the show notes, no problem. You've got any uh, sponsors or partners you'd like to uh, plug? Uh, I don't have many sponsors. I there's The guys from uh, Three Sports in, here in Sweden, they own a little shop just near where I live. They, uh, they help me out a little bit with some gear. So a shout out to those guys and then uh, Shots Nutrition, Hub, Wetsuits. Although, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean there's – I don't know if they're sponsors but they're, I know a lot of people in these stores like Giant Bikes in Australia. Those guys have always helped me out but I I, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a sponsored athlete. For It's more that I'm friends with people from there. I'm, 
not sponsoring me because I'm a good athlete. All right, excellent. Um, how's your Swedish, by the way? Yeah, um, I can speak fluent Swedish, but I cannot write or read much. But uh, I can, I get by with yeah, speaking and a conversation. I'll say I have conversational Swedish. I see. Yeah, you have taken lessons. I took a few lessons before I left Australia and then I took some when I got here. But to be honest, I, when I got a job, my Swedish just went like through the roof, just being immersed in it a lot more than sitting in a classroom just doesn't work for me. All right. Thanks for your time, Rachel. Um Thanks so much for having me. All right. Cheers. See you later.